bottom right. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. So we are set. We just have to share this. Oh, I'm sharing. Oh, I'm already sharing the screen. Oh yeah. So that's not even something we have to. Do. Okay. So we are cooking. We're cooking with guests, Doug Cotter. Chris, wait for the big show. <laughs> How are you, man? How are you doing? How are you doing? Hey, good to see you. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, of course. I'm gonna have to come out a little early. All right. Schedule oh yeah, you know. So uh, you got to make sure you you supply me with the, the annual uh, calendar and then I'll yeah, uh, <laughs> you're working around my calendar. <coughs> Sorry. How's things with you? Pretty good, man. I uh, I'm looking around a little bit, hurt myself hiking. Oh no. And might have a uh, like a heel spur, so I got to see a podiatrist tomorrow about it. But it's like I was telling my parents because I hit you on your heel. It's on the back of my heel. On the back. That's why I've got these okay. like hip, hip shoes with the suit. Um, yeah. Tell my parents yesterday because I had like a, a back problem recently too. I was like, I feel like my body is a car that hit a hundred thousand miles and everything is breaking down. What do I got? Get your collar up. My collar up. How do you know that's not a new fashion trend that I'm trying to start? Uh, <laughs> the shoes. And they tell me right away you're not a fashion trend. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So James Parrott, he's presenting today? Oh, excellent. What time? Uh like probably around ten. Uh, miss. But he's gonna we're gonna record it. He's gonna be remote because he tested positive for COVID this morning. You're kidding. <laughs> That's still a thing. <laughs> I, it's spiking right now. It's it's apparently spiking. So right. you know, yeah, it's a thing. Um I was I was feeling under the weather a couple of weeks ago and I was Multiple COVID tests at home that I use. Oh, yeah. Just in case. Just in case. Yeah. Stuff slipping around. It's not an emergency, but it's like, that shit's real. Yeah. Um, is this picking me up? Yeah. I think this is uh, recording us. So, yes. <laughs> we have to be a little bit mindful, I guess. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, did you kill him or not? Uh, did you kill him? I think that goes through Chris's shoes. Yeah, right. Very fashionable. My shoes. For the record. For the YouTube but record. Because, you know, like at least 40 people watch these uh, with uh, videos. And at least 40. There's a lot, of, a lot of people out there that are going to be hearing this. Cool, man. All right. Hey. Hey. Yes. How are you? It's so good to see you. Good to see you. How are you? It's been a while. Thanks for coming. It has been a while. Yeah. We're starting to plan more. Can we sit anywhere? You may sit anywhere. Yes. Yes, please. Um, there is coffee and food in the back here. Oh, great. Right. Well, there's only coffee. And Colleen, I didn't let you. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Your ears per You can't see it from over there, but it's definitely here. Uh, you were busy setting up. Yeah. Coffee, no tea. Coffee, no tea. Hi, I'm Doug. Hi, I'm Doug. Nice to meet you. How are you? Hi, I'm Doug. Hi, Doug. Colleen. Hi, Colleen. Nice Pleasure to meet you. Doug, if you, well, I, guess so. I was going to say, we have hot water, but there's, there's no tea. There's no point, right? Uh, <laughs> there must be tea somewhere in the building. Or should we move these? <laughs> was it Jocelyn? Jocelyn. Colleen. Nice to meet you. I know. Uh, it's I mean, like I a new era. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, this it's is my first one. It's a real my first one. And you know, since she's, COVID, uh, I've been on the floor for a while. Uh, I'm with MasterCard now. Oh, nice. Yep. So my old boss was signed Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. We can have it. Nice. So I, um, sure. I live in Brooklyn. I run the Brooklyn Community Foundation. Oh, that's why I know. Oh, really? The work. Well, so um, I worked with Greg Bishop. You come oh, a lot of work. I do. We're getting ready to do a great program with them. I'm really excited oh, about Oh, that's awesome. Oh, um, wow. My friend Babby Jacobs is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. She's very active. Oh, wow. Entrepreneurial, you know, supporting small businesses. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, yeah, just keeping the key in our Oh, love how the organization is involved. Thank so, you. So nice to have a place for the need. Yeah. Like Oprah. You, get a, you get a packet. You get a packet. You know, we did when I was with the city. Mm -hmm. MasterCard oh. um, has such a global purpose. Most right. of what we do is. <laughs> Black Rose for visitors. Oh, okay. Hair, it's going to be there too. Oh. Yeah. I don't want to be interrupted I, I mean, when I leave, so I'm going to... But our colleagues in the center of the Pacific Road. Close to the door. I'm Maureen. Hey, Maureen. 
Oh, they were. They, it wasn't our event. It was someone else's event. Already participated. But Salah Das, she works for Shemina. Um, Are you more? Yes, and I am Chris. Chris. So Commissioner, nice. Commissioner Felter, it's too nice to meet you. As one of those maps, yeah. All right, welcome. And the folks I work with on that team mostly are focused on in solidarity. Where are you currently? Black somewhere? communities. Uh, um, so, uh, on business, so I'm on the business side, but I'm the director of the Good an interesting role because I'm really trying to work with our clients, which yeah. are banks, yeah. to oh. do more. Go ahead. I would love to. Way. What banks? What banks do you guys? Oh my God. I mean, City is our largest global yeah. 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 bank. Yeah. 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 What, what card am I in? It's my from Sterling. Sterling. No, I don't know. It's not a bank. It's Sterling. I got acquired, yeah. and yeah. but my but my card is Mastercard. Excellent. Yeah, so it's like it's, hear it's, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, where do you want me to sit? Uh, sit at the table for okay. you. Um, Are you yeah. looking a little, Chris? I am. I hurt myself hiking. Oh, you feeling better or worse? It, it comes in and goes. Today it's a little bit better, but probably because yeah, I rested. Yeah, you like, never know. Abby, <laughs> yeah. why don't you sit here? And Mark is welcome to sit here. Okay. Does he have a Mark was to card? No, we got that email. Uh, oh, where's that at? It's um by the Liberty Train Station. Oh, how are you? Um, how are you doing? Yeah, it's in um, it's in New York. Okay. Yeah, I met Michelle a long time ago, oh, just after she had, she won't remember, but um and then she she was uh, so um, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Where's the dishwasher? Oh yeah, that was yeah. cool. Really impressive. Well, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And that's yeah. helping. Yeah. 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 Even before we had our board of trustees and board uh, of uh, conferences. Uh, so nice. How are you? Yeah. What was that last yeah, time? Yeah. Yeah, He's the commissioner of the day. Uh, cool uh, 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 you can sit uh, at the, the table, uh, and I thought we were making a name uh, tag uh, for you. I don't think it was one of Okay, all right, go ahead. Just sit. I guess yeah. 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 you are a distinguished guest. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Not a problem. Happy to be here. Not so long ago either. How are you? So good to see you. Thanks for coming. Congratulations. Oh, there's a lot of people. Yes, of course. It's yeah. nice to see you again. Well, I hope you're going to enjoy uh, enjoy your day here with some of the best places. Right? Right? <laughs> right? You just want to put yourself yeah. with it. That's it. <laughs> Uh, What's up? Is it going to be uh, well, no, there's a lot of cool stuff busy, happening right now. I think, it's, uh, um, it's very busy, it's good. It's a good busy, yeah. It's a good busy. Um, so like you want to see it all the way you are. From another meeting here, you used to be on the green economy. And then I think you're going over to um, to Lafayette, and there's a whole bunch of stuff for all of the youth commissioners who had understand. All right, good thing. Oh, very cool. Well, City Hall is really cool. When I first worked at the city, he just needs testing. One, two, three. Everybody can hear me? So enjoy. Nice to meet you. Help yourself. Nice to like coffee or Morning. Hi. Morning. Morning.
Part of the state education. Absolutely. Uh, 1199 training. Nice. How nice. Yeah. That's interesting. We work with a lot of young people. Yeah. Do a lot of transition. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Nothing is mountable. I talked to actually Daniel and just was at our Chris is yeah, Chris um yeah, Chris right exactly so about ways that you can sort of keep them to collaborate. So we have always traditionally participated in the national registration through HCAP. Had dual registration for certain occupations, but we're in the process now. Okay. No, luckily other people were talking about Yeah, we're going to help. We're going to help. How many should I mark you down for? How many should I mark you down for? Well, that's a little premature right now. What's the time? What's the time, Rod? Before you register, they have to meet the criteria. I know, I know. But we, you know, we, I get what you're saying, but as you know, we're going to need some time. Hi, good morning. How are you? <laughs> yeah. But you have to kind of like, you have to let Oh, wonderful. I'm the CEO of New York City Club and Training Coalition. We're supposed to let our board. Ten. We'll talk. We'll talk. No, I think, I mean, it's going to take. You have virtually none. Showing up and then kind of like the red and so Oh, almost congratulations. I just like at this point of having the numbers, please appreciate the astonishment. All right. I want to start for your choice. There's a couple of things to smooth out in this context of what we're working now as relates to step one, getting stuff registered. This is mostly what happens. We're very interested in the time. So literally, a lot of it is part of our. They were not international. One is the Detroit to a grant. We said we couldn't protect it. It's New York State. So obviously, we said we'd be doing some work. And then, you know, you want to be good partners in the city of New York. Certainly, it's helpful with the SA and other organizations. You can see it figures in New York State. We'll bear it. We'll bear it. A variety of reasons. Oh, they can be helpful. Okay. Yeah, I well, I think now it's June 20th. It's weird that it was me there, like, after the like, no, it's And I
I thought so too. I mean, there's a few people like core group that know us, but then there's always they say, but we have to do it. So that's wonderful. Will we be ready? Yeah. So more to come. This this week is the case file review. I know she's going to be here in July. That's um, a yeah, but they want to. They don't want to do an abuse site. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I wonder why. Or, I, um, um, I think that's that. Well, she was situated. I don't know. Yeah, they, in the Harlem. I think no. That's what they said. I just. I think they said that they. At and this time, expected like they just want to see like hat. several sector risks. And so also, there's like Washington Heights, yeah. like the work we're doing. Oh, the other work we're doing. So, I mean, if you have a future mind, no, I know. I know you guys will be red carpet. Welcome. I'm sure. All right. So, would you sit here? Because we have not re up to the price of your She's a member. She's a member. Yeah, well, so she does. She
This is actually going to be Yeah. 
confronting and insulting by the slide. Oh man, that far off. I know. I I appreciate it. That's great. We're just, I'm just trying to sell it. I mean, so if you can go back to the next slide. I think he's, he said no, he's uh, Greg Morris, he's the executive director. Oh, it's very good to meet you. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. We have everybody upstairs. I don't know more. <laughs> oh, thank you. Stuck downstairs. Okay. Up here, up here. Have, yes, we, I, yeah, I think we have a couple of people. Yes. Good morning and welcome to the June quarterly board meeting of the New York City Workforce Development Board. I'm Adria Powell, I'm the board chair. Um, I'm going to share highlights for today's agenda, some reminders and some housekeeping notes. Go through the, the regular logistics. At our last, um, yeah, at our last meeting in April, we heard from speakers about a youth apprenticeship program from, uh, for New York City high schools. New York City High School students. We also heard from a consultant from Accenture about the landscape analysis they were conducting on apprenticeships in New York City. Today we will be joined again by Rachel Van Tosh, a senior manager at Accenture, and she will be talking to us more about that program. In addition, James Parrott from the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School will share his findings about a disturbing trend. The unemployment rate among black New Yorkers is significantly higher than the unemployment rate among white New Yorkers, a trend that does not reflect the national average and seems to be fairly unique to New York City. So this board has had James Parrott talk to us in the past. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear what he's seeing and have a discussion um, amongst the board. Um, James will be joining us remotely. As far as housekeeping items, the state's open meetings law applies to the Workforce Development Board since it is considered a public body. The open meetings law was temporarily flexible the past three years, but now requires once again that the board have an in-person forum in order to conduct business I think we're a little short. Um, additionally, members may participate remotely if they have a legitimate reason defined in the law, but they do not count towards quorum and they cannot vote. We do have members who are participating remotely today because they had extenuating circumstances. Also note that we are video recording today's meeting and that we will be posting the recording online, which is also required by the state open laws, state open meetings law. As a longstanding policy, we ask that only board members speak during the meeting and please use your microphone since we do have people who are um, participating remotely. 
So first up, we will now uh, hear a brief update on the Youth WIOA programs from Daphne Montanez, Associate Commissioner of, Work of Youth Workforce Connect at DCYD. Yes. And just hit the button, Josh, it's off. No hot mics. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, pleased to be here to provide an update on our youth workforce activities at DYCD. Um, we are gearing up in a few short weeks to launch this summer's SYEP program. And uh, pleased to say that once again, we'll be able to serve over 100,000 young people across New York City, thanks to the commitment by uh, our mayor, Mayor Adams. Um, just for context, uh, we are also working with some of our city agency partners, including uh, CUNY, uh, Department of Education, and uh, Department of Probation. They will actually be serving 5,000 of the 100,000 uh, participants through specialized programming. But the bulk of SYP participants will be uh, administered through DYCD at 95,000. So to give you an update on uh, our numbers, this year, we had a record-breaking number of applications, uh, 174,800 applicants overall. Uh, last year was 165,000 uh, in contrast. As of today, we have over 85,000 young people enrolled, um, and we're continuing to run lotteries until complete. Uh, I will say that this year, we started our application process uh, almost a month earlier, and so we're seeing uh, from the provider wider perspective, our numbers uh, at this stage are, are really encouraging um, and we're pleased that uh, the capacity building that our team has poured into our providers is paying off and uh, everyone is excited and gearing up for the summer. Um, in terms of worksite development, also strong. As of today, we have 13,000 worksites um, that are committed to the program um, and committing over 100,000 jobs as of today. So uh, we're in a very strong position there. As you may know, this year is a very special year for SYEP. It is our 60th anniversary, and uh, we're pleased uh, this summer to really highlight uh, really the institution of SYEP here in the city. We're planning for a culminating event um, at the end of the summer. Uh, we're currently uh, developing a video series uh, highlighting some uh, alumni from all from the 60s on down to today and the impact that SYEP has had in their lives, and we look forward to premiering that video uh, at our culmin culminating event. <laughs> Additionally, we are expanding our enrichment series. Last year, we launched an enrichment series with uh, roughly uh, 50 separate uh, events for young people to complement their SYEP experience. And this year, we are actually uh, almost up to 100 events this year, thanks to the support of so many employer partners and our city agency partners as well. These events will include tours, career panels, career fairs. Uh, last year, we held a wonderful uh, event with the mayor at Gracie Mansion, a cooking demonstration, and then a panel of culinary experts um, had a chance to engage with over 200 of our youth, and uh, we'll be looking forward to engaging the mayor once again uh, this summer. Um, we're happy to share the calendar of events as well. If any of uh, the members here would like to participate either virtually or in person, uh, I think it's always great to have the opportunity to go out and actually see uh, our young people uh, in action during the summer. The six weeks go by very quickly. Additionally, you may have heard this year we're launching a new initiative called SYEP Pride. And this initiative will uh, focus on young people who identify as LGBT uh, individuals and will provide uh, these individuals with activities, workplaces uh, that give them additional supports in a very inclusive uh, manner. And we've had such a groundswell of support around this initiative. Louis Vuitton, um, ABC News, a uh, number of banks and their uh, diversity inclusion offices have all stepped up and uh, 
providing wonderful enrichment and work, uh, work opportunities for young people. So we're thrilled to launch this initiative this year and uh, look forward to watching it grow in uh, additional summers. In terms of our RIOA programs, I know last uh, meeting my colleague uh, Zane Khan had the opportunity to walk through some of the changes that we're anticipating as we're building the concept papers for our RIOA train and earn and learn and earn programs. I'm thrilled to say that we are close to the finish line in terms of releasing those concept papers. We had the opportunity to share a draft of uh, concept papers uh, with the mayor's office of talent and work workforce, uh, our partners at the DOE and CUNY. Um, we will then have OMB, the, the Mayor's Office of uh, Budget, to take a look and uh, provide their comments. Once we receive those comments, we expect that the concept papers will then be released in early July. So look forward, uh, look out for that. Um, once the concept papers are out, obviously we'll be collecting feedback from the field, but we also will continue stakeholder uh, feedback. Feedback. We have sessions planned with providers, participants, um, with employers as well. And all of this feedback will help us develop our RFP, which we target will be released at the end of the year. And that's my update. Anyone has any questions? Okay, thank you so much. We will hear a brief update, update about the adult WIOA programs from Janine Jones, Assistant Commissioner, Workforce One at SBS. Thank you, Janine. All right, is this on now? Oh, perfect. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, so I am actually going to give a quick update on our RFP and where we are in the process. Um, note that this has been a labor of love because we are really trying to get this right. Um, but before I start, there's just two points I want to make. Um, so one, I'm going to um, I'm balancing being trying to be as transparent as possible while still adhering to our procurement rules. So if you have questions, I promise you I'm not hedging. <laughs> um, there might be times where I'll, I'll take your question and might say that I have to get back to you. Um, and then two, um, I just want to highlight that our RFP is really the bones of the, our operations, um, but there's additional meat that happens in terms of our contracting as well as our operating plan as well, because we want to make sure that we're able to stay as nimble and flexible as possible really throughout that time. Um, so I'll say that. Um, in terms of the RFP itself, um, there's really two areas of focus that we really had or two things that were really important to us. Um, so one was um, really developing an expertise in terms of the way that we provide services to our job seekers and really making it customizable depending upon the population served. Um, so over the years, we've really uh, built out programming that was specific to justice involved, uh, out of school, out of work youth, um, what at us uh foreign born Yorkers and so forth. And I think we've done a decent job. Our goal is to continue to go much deeper with that. Um, and we really wanna make sure that we're developing expertise around that. Um, the second thing that was really important to us was really um, making our contracts much more accessible to a number of different providers or vendors. Our contracts are really expensive to run, which means it really limits the number of organizations that can participate. And we think it, it probably leads us not necessarily always getting experts in the field all the time. So we really wanted to start to open that up. Um, with that said, our contracts typically range from anywhere between 2.8 to $5.2 million per year, which is quite expensive. Um, and it's all up upfront costs with reimbursements that happen on the back end. So again, if you can't afford to absorb that cost at the front of it, it really eliminates the possibility that you have an opportunity to work on our contract. The way that we're setting it up now, we're actually one RFP has now become three. <laughs> um, so we are going to still take a borough approach and that's going to be for the bulk of our system. So it is still going to count for about 10 to 11 of our centers. Um, with our borough approach, people will have the opportunity to bid on specific boroughs and they'll operate centers that are accompanied with that. 
The second RFP is really going to uh, be specific to sector centers or sector systems. Um, so right now we have two sector systems. One is our healthcare center um, and the other is our industrial and transportation system. Um, and again, with those centers, we're going to want to go much deeper in terms of the actual occupations themselves within the industry and making sure that people have an understanding in terms of where the ramps on and off are and what development looks like. And it's um, much more high touch than I think our, our regular systems. And the third kind of area our RFP that we're developing is really based upon programming itself. It is going to start with like three very specific programs in the beginning. Um, so it's going to be um, working with our out of school, out of work youth. It's going to be working with our foreign born New Yorkers and it's going to be um, working with our um, justice involved individuals as well. Again, the goal is these contracts are going to be much smaller, so it's going to allow organizations. They may not necessarily be as big, may not be able to absorb the cost, but certainly have the expertise to be able to bid on these opportunities and contracts as well. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Another thing to note is this just so and it currently brings um, it's still a large number. So it's still um, it'll bring kind of the cost of the contract down to about a little bit under a million per year for those very specific centers. But the thing to note on that um, as well is that we started to work with kind of our more robust specialized um, centers or um, programming. If this all goes well, we anticipate rolling it out to additional satellite centers, which um, at that point um, that can range anywhere between 380,000 to about $800,000 a year in some of those contracts. So again, it'll open the possibilities for um, different vendors um, to be able to participate as well, as long as they show the expertise that's necessary. Does anyone have any questions that I'll try to answer? Thanks, Janine, for that overview. Can you um, just talk briefly about the rough timeline? Or is that against the procurement process? Um, we're working on it as quickly as possible. I will say that I think um, one thing I would encourage you to do is you, um, if, if you are wanting to bid on one of the contracts, you have to be in passport. So I do encourage people to start talking to that about organizations now um, would be my recommendation, but we're trying to get it out as soon as possible. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. More to come. Thank you, Janine. Okay. Um, as discussed in our last meeting, Mayor Adams set a moonshot goal for 30,000 apprentice apprentices to be active in New York City by the year 2030. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's meeting, Accenture conducted a landscapes analysis of apprenticeships in New York City over the past couple of months. We will now hear from Rachel Van Tosh, Senior Manager at Accenture, about the findings from that analysis. And Rachel's bio can be found in your uh, packet. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Hit the button, Rachel. Hit the button. Oh. Better? All right. Um, well, thanks for having me back. Really excited to talk about the work we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. I'm going to try to keep it fairly brief. Happy to answer questions afterwards or have any follow-up conversations that you'd like. Um, so as you all know, we did a landscape analysis of apprenticeships in New York City. If we could go to the first slide. That consisted of three different components. Um, analyzing data, which you know, ranged from demographic data to occupational data, uh, conducted more than 50 interviews with experts in New York City, with apprentices, with employers, with folks actually nationally, internationally who've worked in apprenticeships. And we've authored a set of recommendations and findings um, as a result of that work. Next slide. So as we spoke about last time, one of the things that we were tasked with doing was to develop a criteria sort of definition of apprenticeships. So what we developed was a set of sort of threshold measures that you have to meet in order to be considered an apprenticeship um, for the purposes of the city, and then a set of best practices, which is what the city would recommend, potentially what would you know, get priority in terms of investments, things like that. I won't read through like every single 
thing on this list, although happy to answer questions about it if there are specific ones. Um, some notable ones is that uh, you know an apprenticeship has to be designed intentionally with um, a full time role at the end of it. So it's not like a, a trial. It's really a, a onboarding or sort of starting of doing a full time role that the apprentice will stay in. Apprentices need to be paid. There need to be a you know both an earning and learning component. So you know structured classroom component of the work. And there also needs to be a focus on equity and accessibility for apprentices um, in the program design. So making sure that it's open and there's opportunity for all. Um, as it happy to answer some more questions about this, you can see that there's um, also a set of best practices here, which is again, what would be um, recommended in this case. You can go to the next slide. Uh, Maybe um, scroll down a little bit so you can see the bottom of this. Well, it's sorry if you could go back to the previous one. Okay, so you can't see it at the bottom, but you see the little bit of the left hand corner there is the blue, and that's New York City. Um, <laughs> like the, the key point. Um, we took a look at peer cities across the United States, so cities that had a similar um, economic mix to the businesses here, as well as ones that are, are large in population, like over a million people. And New York City is at almost the very bottom in terms of the concentration of apprentices within the city. So we have a lot of room to grow compared to what other cities are doing. You can go to the next one. One thing to note, so we looked in addition to sort of where do we stand across the country, we looked at some like who are apprentices and, and what are the apprenticeships that are available in the city right now. Um, as most people would probably not be surprised to learn, most of the active apprentices in New York City are in the trades. Um, a few like notable exceptions that I think are you know, top here are electricians, carpenters, that's very similar to what you see in some peer states and peer cities as well. A couple of things that are worth noting though, is that um, you'll see the third uh, largest number of active apprentices right now are school safety agents, which is actually an apprenticeship done by the New York City Police Department. Um, and one of the things that you know, we recommended the city think about is what might be the opportunities around public sector apprenticeships despite you know there's there's many complications there but a place to be thinking about another thing that i think is interesting is you'll see here there's two columns one from nysdal and one that's nationally registered so as an apprenticeship you can actually register with the state or with the at a national level and you'll see that the mix of folks who are registered nationally is actually quite different and much more focused in healthcare and professional services so although the like state registered apprenticeships are heavy trade. There is an interest in uh, you know, sectors and occupations outside of the traditional trades in New York as well. Go to the next one. Great. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm over here. Use the mouse and pull it down to the bottom and then let it go for a second. All right, let's see. The 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 to the 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 this is compared to the overall city population. Um, and you'll see the um, blue, light blue, are nationally, are New York State registered apprenticeships, and the gray are the nationally registered ones. So, uh, what I think is interesting here is that, um, again, this is all registered apprenticeships, that there's actually like a, well, there's still a concentration and, you know, people identify as white are overly represented. There's actually like a diversity of folks 
and apprenticeships in the city. Um, and that's true for ones that are registered nationally as well. So I think that um, it's something that should be like understood and built upon. And as people, as we think about how to change like hearts and minds of folks who are interested in apprenticeships and making sure that people can see themselves as an apprentice, I think there's going to be a lot of cases that we can draw on to demonstrate the diversity of apprentices in the city. Um, if we go, can I go to the next one? No. Oh no. Um, <laughs> if we go to the next one, you can see that the same is not true for gender. Um, there are very few women represented in apprenticeships, <coughs> with the exception of um, in the nationally registered apprenticeships, and that's predominantly driven by a few occupations in that sector, like home health aides, which is the largest group nationally. It's heavily um, female, so I think there's there's more work to do here. Next one. So I'm sorry that this is a little bit small, probably for folks to read. Um, will this get sent around to folks after the thing? So um, I'll just quickly go through a couple of key learnings from all of our conversations and our research. We bucketed into five different areas, which do align um, roughly with the recommendations that we made as well. So around like program design and quality, some of the things that I'm sure you all have heard of before, like the need for support for apprenticeships, the success of things like cohort approaches, but also what we heard from almost everybody we spoke with is that there is a the, probably one of the most critical things is an investment into the apprentice supervisors and making sure that they're well prepared um, to host apprentices and to train them because as we all know, like you become you can become an expert in your field and elevate it and not necessarily become a great trainer for somebody else. So thinking about how to um, help people really give apprentices the best experience and the best training um, was something we heard across the board. In terms of resource alignment, um, what we saw is that like states worked um, in tandem with like federal resources and philanthropic philanthropic resources in order to create um, the sort of ecosystem level investment in apprenticeships. And that's really what has allowed places like California and South Carolina to exponentially increase the number of apprentices is that all these different investments coming together around like a shared vision and shared goal. Um, and as I said, there's a, there's a number of different sources that people have used and figuring out how to use all of those together will be key in order to move apprenticeships forward. The third is around communications and branding and thinking about how to ensure both employers and you know potential apprentices, students, job seekers see apprenticeships as something for them and you know not like sort of how you might think of your grandfather's apprenticeship being. Um, and so we have a set of of learnings from folks about how you do that. Um, the third is when you think about apprenticeships, making sure that you know justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, are really built into the program. The way that folks have done that most successfully is to make sure that there is like pre-training and pre-apprenticeship programs that are really high quality and designed to funnel people and prepare people for <laughs> apprenticeships, and also like do very targeted, very intentional outreach so that folks know about this opportunity. Um, and there were some interesting cases like in Wisconsin, they're working with individuals who are currently incarcerated to have them participate in apprenticeship. So when they are able to leave or actually like have a role. So there's there's different ways to do it um, beyond just like typical outreach, which is still very important. Um, and then finally, for infrastructure and governance, um, the places that again saw the most growth had somebody who was behaving as sort of the oversight aligner like central um, engine of apprenticeships to work with all the different actors in the field and we saw that in every single city and state that we spoke with there are different forms of it in different places but that sort of central 
um, entity was was critical. Next slide. So let's see. So we recommended you know, five different things within each of these are you know four or five more specific recommendations. I won't go through all of them, um, but happy to talk about them at another time with anybody who's interested. So the first is leveraging untapped resources, um, which is both making sure that we're leveraging all the funding that's available from the state, federal, philanthropic side. Also thinking about how to help employers who are already um, doing earn and learn models, help them like move it into an apprenticeship. So how do you take the willing to the next level? The second is around rebranding and trumpeting the value proposition and thinking about that for all the audiences, you know, employers, students and parents, educational institutions, and frankly, like government itself. The third uh, around centering justice, equity, diversity and inclusion. So again, going back to some of our learnings, thinking about how you develop high quality pre apprenticeship training, how you think about outreach and connecting um, outreach to cities investments, like making sure that any place that the city's dollars go have this as an explicit part of their work and their mission. The fourth is aligning and improving infrastructure. So thinking about how different groups in the city can work together in order to support employers and students and job seekers with apprenticeships. That includes, you know, um, thinking about how this body could be um, promoting and moving apprenticeships forward, as well as other entities in the city, um, you know, workforce development organizations, CBOs, et cetera. And then the fifth is thinking about how to track and amplify outcomes. And our recommendation there is um, sort of a set of quality indicators that we think is important in order to track the success of any apprenticeship programs. Then a sort of three part system of how you leverage um, existing registered apprenticeships and the network of providers to gather apprenticeships. And then thinking about like a long term research agenda. How are folks faring over multiple years after they've gone through an apprenticeship? What does that meant for their career? And then thinking about how to trumpet that success through things like existing public reporting forums. And going back to the central learning about what has been key to moving this forward. It is this like conductor entity, this engine of the work. And so what we recommended is setting up an apprenticeship accelerator, which you know was talked about in the mayor's announcement, but thinking of it as a way not to duplicate existing efforts, but to align them, to fund them, to make sure that they're all moving in the same direction, track progress. Um, and so we laid out sort of a, set of principles around which this accelerator would operate um, as part of the overall ecosystem in the city. As if you can see some of the key, uh, key functions of it here. I know that was very fast, threw a lot of information at you all. I don't know, Chris, if we have time for questions, if I made it under my 10 minutes. Okay, um, well, yeah, happy to take, happy to take any questions. And you know, I can I think I could go back in slides. <laughs> also happy to talk about it, like I said, one on one if you want. Sure, you know. The team will be working on this for a while, so be an ongoing dialogue. Yeah, of course. Are you looking at very specific um, recommendations and strategies around how to engage more black New Yorkers in the apprentice program beyond just like having an equity and inclusion um, you know, lens, but how do you make sure? Are you thinking about that as one of the recommendations? Yeah, so the, the five you saw there, like again, it's just the very high, they're like the buckets of them. Within each of them, there's another set. There's nothing explicit about any one nationality or race in the set of recommendations that we have. What we're recommending um, like at this level is more an explicit like 
contract valuation criteria need to be aligned to this, to how the, the city is going to target specific races or ethnicities is probably like one or two clicks down from the set of recommendations that we provided. It just looks like it looked like to me, and maybe I was not you know looking at it yeah. correctly, that there is a real gap there. Um, very particular Do you wanna, to New York. Can I go back on this or? So yeah. actually, if you look at the, the dark blue is the city population and the percentage of black individuals in apprenticeships are the light blue and the gray. Actually, this New York City compared to peer cities performs much better in terms of um, black individuals in apprenticeships. I, we could always do better, but it's compared to other places. Um, I don't think I have that slide, but if you're interested, we have a, a table in the report where you could see it. Um, it's it's almost double the average that other cities have. Thank you. And, and it's disproportionate, more black of the population in apprenticeship. Because that's the second bucket there. I don't know if you can see it from here. Yeah. And so I think what we have to look at more even more closely is what are the occupations and making sure that the occupations are ones that are getting to um, a family sustaining wage. Okay, yeah, completely. Agreed. Yeah, because I was a little afraid of a of a um and I did I was a little afraid of a apprenticeship program by the NYPD for school safety agents. Like that's not a living wage. And it'd be interesting to understand like who's in. So yeah. So that's yeah, and I think this is good tee up for the next conversation. Yeah, I'm um, interested. Yeah. Because I again, and this is highlighted in the executive order 22, disaggregating the data is so important, and particularly as we're seeing this trend around um, the black unemployment rate, and also when we sort of break it down by age group. Yeah, and it's certainly that there are certain occupations that drive that participation in the city. Um, I wish I had the breakdown here in front of me, but we do look at that in the study if you're interested. Along those lines, mm -hmm. what struck me was that um, while there is definitely uh, a distribution of um, black New Yorkers who are receiving apprenticeships, the ones that um, the New York City apprenticeships definitely have a number of occupations with a much higher living wage, and that's where black people are less represented. What is the uh, stream of funding that ends up, for instance, for the work providers for say, metal shop apprentices? How does that work for the city? Um, well, many of the, let me know if I'm answering your question correctly. Um, for like metal shop workers and carpenters and folks, those are typically sponsored by unions. And unions, you know, there's different ways that they arrange it, but typically as part of the dues, they'll train like a funding um, training entity. And that training entity is what helps to support apprenticeships. So it's not, it's not as, not that there's no public funding that goes into it, but that's really the driver for most of those um, apprenticeships in the construction and sort of manufacturing trades, but especially construction. That's that's helpful. But I guess what I'm asking is what leverage does the city have to um, promote the fact that there should be a greater level of <coughs> diversity and inclusion within maybe who they're pulling their ranks from for those apprenticeships that are union sponsored? It's a great question. I mean, one of the ways that it has been done so far, I don't know about for metal workers, but um, for project labor agreements in the city, um, if you are bidding on uh, city construction projects, you're required um, to like, work with various pre-apprenticeship programs and offer apprenticeships that um, we've set goals around use of different um, like sort of programs that then promote diversity of apprenticeships. So we've used contracts as a leverage point for that through the project labor agreements. Um, I do think that that's something that could maybe be strengthened or considered as the next round of project labor agreements are negotiated. Abby, yeah. yeah, and I just wanna jump in here um, because literally as we speak in Albany, the city is working with the 
legislature to get community hiring passed. Yeah. Um, fingers crossed is this year it might actually get passed, but if you want to call any of your representatives, um, because while we have the project labor agreements because of state procurement rules, we're not in, in, able to require um, and, and include it in our selection criteria for the city spend. And so that's what we're trying to fix in Albany so that we are more able to use the city spend to encourage community hire and apprenticeships through that. And we have uh, Les Bluestone on the uh, remote. He's remote and has a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Audra. Uh, did, when you were doing the comparisons around the country or other cities, how about metrics in, in a way of comparing the cities and about weighing, ways of determining how successful the strategies are? In terms of like well, what? we're making we're making recommendations about what um, you know what a, an uh, an optimized system might look like, uh, but how about metrics in in to to measure those results? So we did make a, a set of rec uh, one of the recommendations in our like tracking and amplifying bucket is a recommendation on a set of metrics that the city should use in order to track outcomes related to apprenticeships. And, and you know they're often fairly common across different places. Not everybody has the same, but it's like wage, long-term uh, career trajectory, things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just wondered if there, you know, with your your, you know, your your chart and your graph about how the universe could look. I'm wondering if the metrics are any different as a result of that system. You know, it's a, it's a good question. I, we didn't get down to what we looked at a lot was really growth in those different areas. So places like is it California, South Carolina, Wisconsin, places who've had big growth. Um, we took lessons learned from those places. Um, and some of them publish those types of outcomes metrics. Some of them don't. I, yeah, I had a related question, which mm -hmm. is the number of internships in New York City as a percent of total employees in the city. Have you compared that across the country in terms of where there's the most success? We did not look at like internships per se. We did look at to some level at like unregistered apprenticeships in the city um, using our. I'm sorry, did I say internships? I meant yeah. <laughs> I meant apprenticeships. Sorry. So looking at you know, if there are X, you know, if apprenticeships in New York City currently represent 1% of the total number of employees in South Carolina, it's 10%, for example. Mm -hmm. What are they doing that we're not? I, I'm just curious, is I'm guessing the New York City level may be fairly low. Yeah, but, um, maybe now that we've figured out how to get rid of this black box at the bottom, do you want to go up a slide or two? So there's New York City um, New York compared City to this is two percent. Yeah, compared to like you know many other big cities in the state. So we did we did it at like a city level, so you don't see something like the state of South Carolina here. Right. But you can see it's relatively low. And what I would say is I don't think that there's a magic bullet to growing the number of apprenticeships. I think it's a set of changes across the whole ecosystem, thinking about how to better integrate. Um, earning experiences into the education system, thinking about how to best leverage federal funding, how to talk to employers. Like it's it's all of those pieces that need to be moved in order to increase the number and the percentage. Um, and that's what we saw in places that have higher percentages. And that's you know sort of what shaped our recommendations. What are the numbers we're talking about in these uh, pre-apprentice construction jobs? Sorry. Yeah, just want to use the mic. Use the mic. Hi. Hi. You're referring to the pre-apprentice uh, construction jobs. What are the numbers that you're talking about? You know, I'm. I'm sorry. I don't know completely off the top of my head what the numbers were in most recent years. Um, 
I'm sure we could look at it and get back to you on what at least the percentages were that are required in the PLAs. Well, I'm assuming, uh, now the five partners that you're using with direct entry. Right. That would be new, that would be the carpenters you have. So you go to them, you ask them to take people into your program, like the CW pre-apprentice with the building trades. Is that it? Do you, I mean, those, do you know how those, many people sorry. from your centers you recommended to these pre-apprentice uh, people with direct entry? I mean, because that's a great thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, I don't I don't know that. I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head um, what we've recommended, but I don't actually know the, the full numbers that have come into the programs. I don't know, Tim, uh, there might be somebody else here who would be able to speak to that. Well, Ed Christensen from the Operating Engineers is here, and, and I'm here. We are two providers in that sense. Uh, so I'd be curious to know what you're telling your colleagues about the numbers, who's going, how they do, what's the attainment rate, dropout rate. We didn't uh, look. Skills and pre-testing and that kind of thing. So we you didn't... have somebody that's doing this construction trades pre-apprentice program for you? Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Hi, everybody. My name's Tim Currier. I'm the executive director of construction and industry partnerships. Um, so yeah, there we go. No. Sorry, um, executive director of construction industry partnerships. To answer your question, Joe, <clears throat> yes, the city has a goal of around 700 pre apprenticeship graduates every year. Usually the graduation rates are well above 80%. Um, I don't know specifically, but a lot of the adult programs that the Department of Small Business Services has worked with over the years, their graduation rates are above 90%. Um, placement rates um, usually are north of 75% within six months, but you know. A lot of the pandemic happened. There was some slowdowns in work. We're kind of catching up to that now. So we're starting to see that actually increase in a shorter period. So definitely a big um, supporter of those programs and always trying to figure out with our partners how we can expand those. But definitely our you know agency and our, our office is um, you know, keen on continuing to support those. And expand them, yes, of course. Because as my colleague Randy asked before, most of these individuals in these pre-apprentice programs are minorities. It's very important. Access, contracts, <clears throat> placement is yeah, absolutely. minority represented 75% program. Oh, it's, I think, again, I think it's actually north of 75 in terms of um, demographics breaking down by race, but we also target the high poverty zip codes throughout the city um, that, you know, are part of the project labor agreement goals as well. So again, we have a kind of a couple of different strategies um, as well as the individual populations, veterans, individuals that identify as female, et cetera. So. The um, other issue, it's, uh, the con construction trades and apprenticeships are not, you know, that's consistent with New York City. Very important. Carolina, I don't know what about. They're not union jobs anyway, so I could kill us. The reality is what you're trying to do and what the Allo is trying to do is get apprentices throughout. And I, your, one of your last meetings, I said the whole key to apprenticeships is business buy-in. You know, unions can want it, get there and part of their bargaining, but the reality is what business? It was MetLife, insurance company facing AI problems, suddenly turn around and say, I'm going to have an apprentice program? Uh, you have here the restaurants. What restaurants? Is Rock involved in that pre-apprentice? I'd be curious to know. It's a difficult task. Yes, as I said, the other one day, it's probably the future, you know, along with worker co-ops, it's probably the future as we people get laid off, they need a, a strong way to go to your centers, to a industry. Where are we six months later with this planning for the pre-apprentice? Is it, have you got any corporations, B Corps or whatever, industry sector leaders talking about apprentice programs? Um, uh, want me to respond? I mean, we do. Um, in fact, I was just in a meeting yesterday um, with the New York Jobs CEO Council. Um, they've launched along with, um, led by Accenture, Aon, and Zurich Insurance, an apprenticeship network that particularly looks at um, businesses, typically larger businesses, so Fortune 500, um, looking at occupations in business operations, IT, finance, 
um, and they're increasingly looking at healthcare as well. Um, so they're very interested in doing that and working on trying to understand what percentage of the 30 by 30 they're going to own. And they're looking at it um, by occupation. And the concept is that they would develop the occupancy, uh, sorry, the competency plans for those occupations as, and, and grow the number of apprenticeships in their member um, memberships. They'd also, in their membership of the apprenticeship network, as well as grow the number of members. And then work with to work with small and medium sized businesses and chambers of commerce to try to figure out how to make sure our smaller um, businesses have access and the ability to do apprenticeships, whereas they may not have the um, same ability to sort of create those competency plans and build them from the get go, but hopefully they can leverage them. And so I, I definitely hear you like I think one of the goals very much here in terms of the apprenticeship goal is not just the number but making sure apprenticeships reflect the occupations that power New York and really go into those entry level positions. And so looking at it across areas um, that haven't traditionally had apprenticeship. And I'll just add one more thing and I'll stop, is I think you know, we've had the, the, um, the good fortune here in New York um, where there are union apprenticeships and the union training organizations, as you know, are so critical to doing that. Um, so trying to figure out where we get that intermediary support in areas that aren't unionized um, is, is, a, is a big question and what the economic model behind that. And that's where I'm super pleased to see um, New York City Public Schools as well as the City University of New York increasingly thinking about apprenticeship and how to sort of tie apprenticeship into their um, student pathways. Um, because if we can have those two institutions really providing the sports, the supports and some of the um, credentialing and skills training, that would help um, advance the work significantly. Yes, um, yes, yes. So, yes. so um, there's a lot going on there. So one is in the fall, um, as some of you may know, the mayor and the um, and the New York City Public School Chancellor um, announced the Modern Youth Apprenticeship um, Program, um, really working based off of the career-wise model, which has looked at Switzerland. And if folks don't know, in Switzerland, about 70% of 15-year-olds go into apprenticeship. Um, and they're very focused on making sure that's not what they necessarily do for life, but it um, provides them um, greater opportunities. They can always go back to school and become a university professor. So it provides a lot of opportunities. Um, so based on that, they have um, a goal of 3,000 youth apprenticeships um, and, be, and it begins in junior year and it goes for three years. Um, so they're actively working on that. Um, they launched in um, 2019, so they're building that out. And they're working very much with a particular set of school of high schools. The high schools can support the students both in preparing to make the decision to do apprenticeship as well as being in the apprenticeship. Um, CUNY's also been working. Um, so CUNY has always had in the continuing ed side support of apprenticeship. Um, and so they're trying to get a better handle on how much of that is going on across all of their campuses. But they are also very closely working with um, industry, um, um, including members of the um, CEO council to help to really um, look at apprenticeship as part of the associate's degree and really revamping some of their applied associate's degree to weave in apprenticeship and apprenticeship support. So it's a work in progress. Um, it's exciting. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. Hey, Rachel. So Hi. two things, just by way of reference, the national figure is 0.3% nationally in terms of utilization, right? So sort of within that band. But I had a question about, did you take a look at the efficacy of some of the policy changes that have been implemented. So across a couple of the states that you mentioned, mostly related to funding, right? So some states have taken traditionally the tax credit path, which is not as helpful in certain sectors like the healthcare sector because of the nonprofit status of a lot of the organizations there. California, as an example, has just implemented this innovation fund where they're giving a certain amount to support per apprentice as well. Was that part of the landscape analysis you did? So we looked at them. A bit. What I'll say is like the California mod. So like you are right that a lot of places have invested in this tax credit model. And in some places like South Carolina, um, that even that small amount has helped to spur 
apprenticeships forward um, with some additions of federal government funding and things like that. The California Innovation Fund, super interesting. Their projections um, for that, which for everyone else, it's a, a fund that provides sort of a uh, base. It, it promotes sort of innovation and apprenticeships and provides sort of a baseline level of funding for employers. Um, their projections for it are huge. I mean, they're projecting hundreds of thousands of apprenticeships coming out of that. They just started accepting applications like two months ago. So unclear if it'll lead to that, but I think, you know, they've done a lot of thinking and work on it and they're basing it on models um, in European countries. So I expect that in six months from now, we'll know a lot more about how exponentially that's increased funding. In our research, again, I don't think there's any like one silver bullet that was like, if you do this, you will dramatically increase the number of apprenticeships. It's about like having a whole set of pieces moving together, funding for that being one of them. I mean, in, in European countries, there's some interesting models like UK, they have a apprenticeship levy where everyone has to set aside a certain portion of their revenues and if they don't use it for apprenticeships they lose it um, and that has you know spurred the number of apprenticeships in the UK um, I, other than that I don't know that I've seen lots that's like this investment equaled this number California we'll see though maybe um, I could talk about this all day <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> probably uh, the two wants to move on and I have to wrap up but Happy to talk about it anytime. And thanks for all these great questions and your engagement. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you to the board for an engaging dialogue and good questions. We are going to move to Chris's report. <laughs> Actually, uh, Chris, I do have a question. You got a question, Joe? Uh, I wanted to ask you about the ITGs, but it's too upsetting, so I'll skip it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, noted. Um, hi, everybody. A um, couple of quick announcements. We are in the presence of a special guest today. Um, Mark Felter is a New York City uh, high school student. He is commissioner. He's participating in a pro new program called Commissioner for a Day that uh, NYC Service is putting on. I think there are over 70 leaders across city government that are hosting a young person. Um, so please, everyone, welcome Commissioner Felter. <laughs> Thanks for being. It's great to have you here, Mark. Uh, commissioner. And you're not commissioner. Where are you a student? WH Maxwell. WH Maxwell, just for folks who didn't hear that on, at home. Um, I also want to thank for the landscape analysis. I want to thank the um, Robin Hood Foundation for funding the, the analysis there. We appreciate their support on that. Uh, I also want to extend a congratulations to, uh, we have Daniel Bustillo here from uh, 1199, SEIU 1199 Training and Employment Funds, standing in for Sandy Vito. Uh, my understanding is that you guys recently won a $3 million grant from the U.S. Department of Labor for Healthcare Career Pathways, so congratulations. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you all to all the members who can make it here. Uh, this is our second in-person meeting in about three and a half years. I really appreciate everybody who came. We don't have quorum. We were trying really hard to get there. I think we're all sort of trying to get our muscles going again for meeting in person. We, the open meetings law, per, I think we would be at quorum if we could count the people online, but fortunately we cannot. Um, okay, so a couple of quick things. Um, Grant, can you go forward? I'm gonna speed through this because I know that um, we're all eager to talk about, you know, hear James Parrott and, and discuss black unemployment. Um, we had a resolution. Uh, we're not gonna vote on that today, but basically just to give a brief summary as you may recall, every year we need to right size 
our funding so that it matches the people that are actually coming through our doors. Uh, go, go back, Grant, sorry. Um, <clears throat> go back. There we go, leave it there. One forward. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details. We'll give you some of this um, by email, but basically we need to right size our funding so that we match the money to the people walking through the Workforce One Career Center doors. OK, and every year we have to make an adjustment. We will put this on the agenda for September uh, and vote on it then. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. OK, so uh, our budget. So as you may recall, we saw a big increase this year compared to last year, uh, largely as a result of the pandemic. Right. The federal funds for WIOA are divided to the states based on a formula. New York State was hit very hard, obviously, by the pandemic in terms of just the sheer volume of unemployed workers. And then New York City in particular was hit very hard within the state. So last this this current year, we received 80, almost 87 million dollars in WIOA funding. And this next year, we are going to be at nearly 100 million. So we saw another jump. Again, the data lags a bit in terms of how the feds and the state apply the formulas. We're going to be at nearly uh, $100 million in WIOA funding. Next slide. So, you know, this, this is sort of the curve. I'll try to get rid of this thing. I need Rachel's magic. All right. Um, <clears throat> you can see, not everybody can see me at home, but, you know, for many years we were between 60 to 65 million annually. That's where we were two years ago. This past year, we jumped up to about 87 million, and now we're going to be. So that's a 57% increase over the past couple of years. Our office is working more closely than ever with SBS and DYCD to make sure we are investing this in a way that aligns with the citywide objectives that the mayor has laid out, including in investing in apprenticeships. So we are we are very closely involved with that, um, and then. Uh, Grant, can you maximize that and go to the, the next slide? Yeah, get that square. Okay, and then so this is a little hard to see, but this is this is our WIOA funding over the last 20 plus years. Um, <clears throat> and so we're here. This is at 100 million, and this is in nominal dollars. We haven't been at 100 million. You can't see it, but 2005 was the last time we were at $100 million. And of course, in 2005, $100 million went a lot farther than it goes today. So it's good news. Again, we're working closely with the agencies to make sure we invest this money well. OK, um, next slide, Grant, please. So I, I'm going to speed through the last couple of announcements here. Um, so Update on the Future Workers Task Force recommendations. Uh, the city has not yet released the recommendations. We had hoped to share them with you uh, in this meeting today, uh, but unfortunately we cannot, but we do expect to release them in the next few weeks. So look for those and we will probably spend some time on those at our September meeting. Um, and a brief update on, you know, asylum seekers, new arrivals, right? I think as you are all very well aware, um, more than 70,000, New arrivals have come to New York City in the last year or so. Uh, and one of the major issues for the population is work authorization. Because if you are in the status of an asylum seeker, you have to wait at least six months before you can be authorized to work on the books. Uh, and we've heard, I guess, anecdotally that it's taking at least a year, right? So one of the things that we're doing in the city is pressing DC to try to expedite the process of letting people be authorized sooner so they can work on the books and support themselves and their families. Um, and we are also trying to be prepared for both helping people as they, you know, as they sort of slowly uh, become work authorized. We're also trying to prepare for a spike because if overnight tens of thousands of people become work authorized, we also want to be prepared for that. So we're working on that. Um, community hiring legislation, Grant, keep uh, go. Yeah, there we go. Community hiring legislation, Abby alluded to this earlier. We know that tomorrow is the last day of the legis legislative session in Albany. We're hopeful this is going to pass. Um, we've brought this to the board before. Again, this is like letting the city, leveraging the city's enormous purchasing power to create uh, employment opportunities, apprenticeship opportunities, and economic mobility for uh, low-income New Yorkers. And my understanding is that <clears throat> the bill bills have been introduced in both 
uh, in both houses, in the Senate and the Assembly, in committee, and we are very hopeful that those will uh, get voted on. But again, tomorrow is the last day of the legislative session, and so uh, it's coming down to the wire here, but we are optimistic. Um, and then one final update on city hiring. So as you probably know, the city of New York is aggressively trying to fill its, its unfilled positions. The city is convening regular recruitment events. That just this week alone, there was a specialized recruitment event for healthcare workers. There's one for engineers. And there's also a hiring hall, which involves, I think, 15 different city agencies recruiting for a variety of positions. They're conducting on-the-spot interviews. These are all positions, uh, unless they stipulate otherwise, where you don't have to already be on the civil service list, where we really want to find people. So if you know anyone who's interested in working for the city, you can send them to nyc.gov slash jobs. There's a lot of information about current openings as well as some of these events. Okay, um, great. Any questions? I know I sped through that, but I want to leave plenty of time for uh, James Parrott in the conversation around black unemployment. Dave. I had one quick question, which was that we are going to be voting in September to reallocate funding to, I believe it's adult workers from dislocated workers. And then when I looked at the 2024 budget, it shows a 37% increase on dislocated workers. And it just doesn't seem to be reflecting the reality we're seeing this year. And I was just curious who comes up with that and what the logic is. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to do the, the brief version. Um, so the, 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 the funding is set by the federal government. But there's three pots of money that every year Congress allocates for WIOA. There's adult, dislocated worker, and youth funding. And they're all based on different, slightly different formulas. And that goes to states through formula. And then the states apply a similar formula, which goes to all the local areas. So in New York State, we're obviously the biggest um, area. So that just comes to us, right? And that is based on a complicated formula. It has to do with like uh, the number of extra uh, unemployed individuals and the money just comes as it comes, okay? So it may be, you know, I forget what, it, it is a big percentage of our funding. However, when you look at the actual customers coming through the doors of the Workforce One Career Centers, for many, for many, many years, it's been it's 20 to 25 percent who qualify as being dislocated workers. And then the balance are considered adults, which is just you're 18 or older and you're eligible for WIOA. Dislocated workers are a subset. They're a specialized population. The bottom line is that we have to right size our funding to match the people we're actually serving because otherwise we can't pay for their services. And we always extremely flexible. You between dislocated worker and adult funding, you can move up to 100% of one into the other. It's very flexible. So this is just a right sizing exercise. That really is all it is in accounting exercise to make sure our money matches the people that we're serving. And so yes, it's unfortunate that we'll have to do it sort of after the fact in September. But we've been in contact with the New York State Department of Labor, and and we're 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 okay. All right, let me end because I really want to get to James Parrott. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we have James Parrott remotely. Many of you know him. We've had presentations. Um, he's presented to this board in the past, and um, we will hear from him now talking about this really disturbing trend that New York City is facing in terms of um, the rates of Black unemployment. Thank you. Good morning. Sorry I couldn't be there in person. I was really looking forward to this. But I, this morning I tested positive for COVID myself. So I uh, thought it wise to, to stay at home. Um, but I, I'm uh, pleased that we're able to do this remotely. Um, I want to walk uh, pretty quickly through some slides showing this anomalous trend in New York City of the black unemployment rate rising while the white and overall unemployment rate is declining and how this appears to be unique in uh, in, in New York City. Um, we don't find that at the national level or in other large uh, cities that have um, comparable large uh, shares of black population. If I can have the first slide. Let me give a little bit of context on the on the labor market overall. So, you, you know, clearly 
COVID's impact had a dramatically uneven impact and workers uh, hardest hit were those in lower paid um, industries and occupations. Uh, it affected a lot of young workers, less educated workers, immigrants and workers of color. Um, but the workers of color uh, figure is largely driven by Latinx workers were considerably overrepresented among those affected, but black workers were actually underrepresented. So the, the two largest employers of black workers in New York City are government and the healthcare sector. And those are both part of the essential category of, of, uh, of, of work. So they weren't as adversely affected by job, job dislocations. Um, we know that in the first couple of months, uh, New York City uh, you know, lost 950,000 jobs. And over the three years since then, many of those jobs have returned. But it's still important to keep in mind um, that hundreds of thousands of jobs were lost for good. Uh, 300,000 jobs were lost due to businesses that closed their doors permanently. And over 400,000 jobs, this is from data from, from uh, uh, 2022, had not returned at employers that remained in business. And while the labor force participation rate overall is now a little bit higher than what it was uh, in, in early 2020, the total size of the New York City labor force is uh, 125,000 persons smaller than before. Um, the number of residence jobs has declined by 170,000. We're going to talk on the next slide in a minute about the payroll jobs almost completely coming back in the aggregate, but there are a lot fewer resident jobs in New York City. And the working age population in New York City, that is all workers 18 and uh, in uh, those 18 and over in the population who are in the labor force or of working age uh, up to age 65, that um, population is 400,000 smaller than it was before the pandemic. There's been a big change in the mix of industries. Face-to-face uh, -face industries are still uh, down by a total of 124,000 jobs overall, with retail and manufacturing down by around 12% compared to pre-pandemic levels. On the other hand, 20 industries have added well over 125,000 jobs uh, in the last three years, although we know that most of those, like home health care, which has been the biggest source of, uh, of employment growth in New York City, are, are, are fairly low-paying industries. There, there had been significant tech industry growth up through the end of 2022, but we've, we've started to see some layoffs um, in, in that sector. One major development uh, that, that we don't yet fully understand is that while New York City's overall unemployment rate has been uh, edging up in the, in the last few months, uh, the latest data show the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate at 5.4%, uh, up from 4.8% uh, last summer. The black unemployment rate has been increasing while the white unemployment rate has been declining. Um, next slide. Uh, just in terms of the, the, the latest employment numbers uh, by industry, you can see here in the orange shading that we're, we're, we're still down about uh, 48,000 jobs from where we were uh, before the pandemic, but, but that is uh, uh, very heavily concentrated in the face-to-face -face industries that are about 125,000 jobs below their pre-pandemic levels. The essential industry category and remote industry categories are, are both up. And it's important to keep in mind that because of the Federal Reserve's interest rate actions, you know, they've raised interest rates several times over the past year, that has been slowing uh, employment growth. Uh, the slowing hasn't been uh, that pronounced at the national level in the last couple of months, but we are start, starting to see the slowing in New York City. And on a seasonally adjusted basis, there was the decline of 16,000 jobs in um, in uh, uh, April of this year. That These are data that are seasonally adjusted at an industry level by the city's Office of Management and Budget to show a slightly different result than what the Labor Department's overall seasonal adjustment figure shows. 
Now, let's turn to the trend in the unemployment rate in the next slide. And you can see for the, you know, the past few years, the trend in the unemployment rate in New York City on a seasonally adjusted basis, we, we look at this on a quarterly basis because this data comes from the current population survey. It's, uh, it's not as large a sample as, uh, as one would like, but we find that if we seasonally, if we um, uh, pool three months of data at a time to look at it on a quarterly basis, that it gives us more reliable results. And what's noteworthy here is that from the first quarter of 2022 to the first quarter of this year, the white unemployment rate and the overall unemployment rate had steadily declined, um, but the uh, black unemployment rate uh, had, uh, it was flat for a while and it has been increasing in the months of 2022. So here's, here's the situation. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that it's really historically unique to see this you know, sustained divergent trend in white and black unemployment rates um, in New York City. So in the first quarter of 23, the black unemployment rate rose to 12.2%, but the white unemployment rate fell to 1.3%, the lowest that it's been uh, in, 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 in this look at it going back to the year uh, 2000. And, you know, when you look at the, the relative trends in the two, in the black and white unemployment rates, generally they move in the same direction. Black unemployment rate typically has been much higher than the white unemployment rate. But when the unemployment rate, the overall unemployment rate and the white unemployment rate is rising, black unemployment has been rising. But in the past, generally they were also falling together. That hasn't been the case in the in the past year um and uh, this uh, obviously is of concern to all of us in the next slide um you'll see you know in, in looking at this in comparison to the national trend and to other cities how new york city is really an outlier on this um black unemployment has declined nationally over the past year the way the BLS calculates the black unemployment rate, they include uh, black Hispanics in that. In the data that, that we presented when we do our own analysis, we, we use mutually exclusive race and eth ethnic categories. So we look at non-Hispanic blacks and non-Hispanic whites um, rather, uh, rather than include Hispanics in, in, in the way that the the uh, BLS does. The BLS also calculates unemployment rates for Hispanics, but they do that just in terms of non-Hispanics as one group and then Hispanics as, as another group. Um, and the gap at the, you know, the difference in the black and white unemployment, um, unemployment rates nationally is much more narrow than in New York City. To do a comparison of other large cities since the CPS, the current population survey sample is uh, smaller in other cities than it is in New York City. We looked at the trends on a four quarter moving average basis, and we compared the, the trend in black unemployment rate to the trend in all, all workers in each of the cities. So in New York City, that gap, if you subtract the all unemployment rate from the black un unemployment rate, um, that was 4.4% at the end of 2022. Uh, but again, the all unemployment rate was declining generally uh, over that period, but black unemployment rate didn't decline. So that's a unique trend relative to other cities. So for example, Chicago had a larger gap between blacks and, and all unemployment rate of 5.4%, but they both declined in 2022. And in Chicago, the black share of the workforce is about the same 25% as it is in New York City. In Philadelphia also, you know, there's a gap close to what it is in New York City, but both black and all unemployment rates declined in 2022. In Houston, uh, the black unemployment rate declined faster than the white unemployment rate. So the gap is pretty narrow, only two tenths of a percent. They're both around 5%. Um, and the black, uh, the black share of the workforce in Houston is 22%. So it's pretty sizable. In Dallas, the, uh, over the past year, the black unemployment rate actually declined faster 
then for whites, the black unemployment rate moved down to 3.9%. Um, and in these other cities that have large black populations, Columbus, Charlotte, and Jacksonville, you'll see there were fairly narrow gaps. Um, and and in, in, a, in a lot of cases, the, the, the trends have been what we've been talking about. Although uh, in the fourth quarter of 2022, the black unemployment rate did rise a little bit in Charlotte and Jacksonville. But again, much narrower gaps between the black and the and the all unemployment rate. So so New York City really does appear to be anomalous in in this phenomenon. And um, it, it's concerning because uh, in the wake of previous economic downturns, I mean, COVID certainly had a, a had a unique impact. It was not just a an economic downturn downturn. But if you look at what happened in New York City after the early uh, 90s downturn or the early 2000s downturn or the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, the Black and Latinx unemployment rates stayed very high in double digits for many years after that. And that obviously you know, makes us very concerned that we're seeing a replay of something like that uh, this time around. Although the Latinx unemployment rate is now around 7%, but the Black unemployment rate is, is the 12.1% 12 12 that we noted. Next slide. When we look at employment rates, so th these are the employment relative to um, the working age population. Uh, you can see the disparities here by race and ethnicity also for whites, the employment rate is actually higher than what it was in the first quarter of 2020, whereas for blacks, it was lower. The employment rate was was around 55 percent. Yeah. Was there was there a question? No, I think somebody was sneezing. <laughs> OK, all right. Sorry. Um, so the black uh, employment rate um, was uh, around 55 percent before the pandemic. And while it's recovered from the worst uh, months of the COVID impact, it's still around three percentage points below uh, where it was. Next slide. So um, this is my final slide in terms of, you know, what do we make of this of this anomalous situation uh, in in New York City? So, you know, I, I certainly don't have a you know any definitive answers here, but but let me point to some factors to to keep in mind. As I've mentioned, Latinx workers were overrepresented in the face-to-face -face industries, but Black workers were actually underrepresented. The but the Latinx unemployment rate has fallen sharply to 6.5 percent in the first quarter. Still, it's much greater than the white unemployment rate. Um, Given the, the great extent of job losses, and here I'm referring to the 300,000 jobs permanently lost due to businesses that closed for good, the 400,000 jobs in existing businesses that haven't come back. So there's been a lot of churn in the labor force. We've seen growth in other industries and so on, but, but, but Blacks have likely suffered from a last hired, first fired phenomenon. Um, and one, one data indication of this is the extraordinarily high black share of unemployment insurance recipients in uh, in uh, New York State. Uh, statewide blacks account uh, for about 16% of the labor force, but uh, you know the latest data for uh, March and April show that blacks accounted for 32% of all those people receiving unemployment insurance. Early in the pandemic, there was extended unemployment. Uh, that went on for many months. Uh, that ex extension, which was federally funded, ended up many, you know, ended back in September of 2021. So under the regular state unemployment insurance program, you could only get unemployment benefits for for up to um, up to six months. So so this this recent trend in the steady growth in uh, in the black share of unemployment insurance. Uh, uh, recipients is an indication that Blacks, uh, among the people losing jobs and who have enough work experience to qualify 
for unemployment insurance. Blacks are disproportionately represented in that group uh, losing jobs. Another factor uh, that, that's likely at play is you know, uh, would be a legacy of racial discrimination in that the black education attainment rate in New York City is much lower than for whites. So the data indicate that 78% of whites ages 24, uh, over age 24 in the labor force have a four-year college degree versus 44% for blacks. And at the, at the other extreme, 32% of blacks uh, over 24 have high school uh, or less as their highest education attainment level. That's nearly three times the share for whites. And, and, and we know from everything that's happened in, in COVID that less educated workers have been hit the hardest. So even though they were not overrepresented in the face-to-face industries, uh, less educated workers, including Blacks, have not fared well in the uh, employment market uh, since COVID. And a, a related factor to keep in mind, um, my sense is that it, it must have some, some bearing here in some manner is that uh, COVID hit uh, you know, very hard at communities of color. And the age-adjusted New York City COVID mortality rate was twice the level for non-Hispanic Blacks as it was for non-Hispanic Whites. It was also very high for uh, Latinx workers, Latinx populations uh, in, in New York City. So, um, you know, I would love to hear uh, people's uh, questions or thoughts uh, about what might give rise, what's behind this disparate trend in unemployment rates and what the city should be doing about it. Thank you. Thank you, James. David. I had one, one question, James, is did you look at the data by education level and see you know, whether it's completed high school, completed college, didn't complete high school, and see if there's a different in, difference in trend by race within those groups? Yeah, so, so we did look at, at education separate from race and ethnicity. Because of the limited sample size, it is challenging to do what, what analysts would call a cross tabulation, where we, we look at two factors uh, we look at race and ethnicity coupled with education. Uh, that's something that we're trying to get a better handle on. We know from the from the standalone analysis uh, by education attainment that um, the unemployment uh, and and the underemployment for less educated workers is much higher than for highly educated workers. The unemployment rate for for people with a four-year college degree or better has been uh, you know, in the two to three and a half percent range for most of the last couple of years. Whereas for less educated workers, you know, it's been in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 percent or so. So it's clear that education attainment is a big factor. And we do really need to uh, you know, start analyzing the data at, at an even more disaggregated level where we look at at education by race and ethnicity. Hi, James. Um, I wanted to ask if maybe there was uh, taking into account some of um, uh, left behind syndrome. We keep hearing about anecdotally, even as that black, more black New Yorkers are leaving the city and um, did, I wanted to ask if maybe in these numbers it's come to play that the people who have been left behind um, have less opportunity creating a somewhat of a disparity in that pool that we're looking at of black New Yorkers. Yeah, so as you can imagine, it, it is uh, challenging to get a handle on that. From, from my uh, uh, look at uh, where the population declines have come, it doesn't seem like there's been uh, a pronounced decline in the black popul the black working age population in New York City. 
uh, the the population decline was heavily concentrated among uh, white non-Hispanics and and Latinx workers to some extent, uh, less so among blacks and and Asians. So, um, and but w what's what's interesting in the data is that there's a you know I I mentioned that there was a a, a much greater decline in resident employment. Um, in New York City. So that comes from the current population survey where it's it's based on people who live in New York City. And your resident employment is a notion that people who live in the city who have jobs, including self-employment. So that number is down much more than the number of payroll jobs in New York City. So payroll jobs in New York City represent jobs in New York City, um, whether they're held by a resident or a commuter. So on the on the payroll job basis, the employment sh shortfall is now down to 50,000 or so in New York City, much less than that's decline in resident employment. And uh, you know, part of the reason for that is that there was a pretty sharp decline in self-employment, in reported self-employment. Now, self-employment can can be a challenge to understand in its own right. It includes small business people, but it also includes people who are effectively just independent contractors, including many who may be misclassified as independent contractors, who are not truly independent contractors, uh, but are, are hired by their employers as contractors because that that yields uh, the businesses a significant uh, payroll cost savings. So. Um, I'm not sure you know, exactly how that decline in self-employment plays out, but that likely is is a factor uh, here as well in in accounting for why um, black employment has not recovered faster. Is this um, DOL data or payroll data? Like, which way are you looking at this? Are you looking at this um, in regards to those receiving UI? Or are you looking at um, data that's more connected to who's employed and the jobs that are available? Yeah. So, so you know, we, we always tend to to glom onto whatever credible uh, government data sources there are, look at those trends, and 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 then try and put together a narrative to understand what's going on. The analysis of the unemployment rate here by race and ethnicity comes from the Bureau of the Census monthly current population survey. This is a survey conducted to uh, estimate the unemployment rate nationally and then at a at a local level uh, overall. So um, all of the unemployment rate data is from the current population survey. The resident employment data that I just spoke of is also from that survey. The payroll employment data comes from the New York State uh, Labor Department. And then there's a separate data set that the state labor department has for people receiving unemployment insurance. Um, in their in their recent data, they they haven't broken out New York City. That's why I referred to the New York State unemployment insurance data earlier. Um, they they do provide uh, data on demographic, occupation, and industry uh, characteristics, though, on the unemployment uh, in. Um, in the unemployment insurance data, and and again, it's important to keep in mind that we're now back at the in the in the period of regular unemployment insurance, where unemployment is only available for for up to six months. So, on that basis, it does look like a lot of the people who have lost lost jobs in the past six months, uh, there's been a significant overrepresentation of blacks. But again, with the with the labor department data. We don't have what's called the micro data that allows us to look at to do a cross tab analysis analysis to look at uh, race, uh, uh, gender, occupation and industry. We can only look at one of those cuts at a time. So it would be great to have better data uh, on, on this. And I've been talking with the city over the years about trying to trying to more fully exploit uh, data series that the that the city has uh, access to. Um, 
one of the things we've been talking about doing is getting access to the micro data from the state unemployment insurance system that it would allow us to do that cross tabular analysis by race and industry and occupation and even uh, zip code location uh, in New York City. So if we had uh, access to that data, we would be able to paint a much richer picture picture of what's going on. So this do, number is, do um, you have, I'm sorry. sorry. No, go ahead. Um, do you have any data around the businesses that went out of business? So the, at least from what I understand, a good majority of small business owners that fall, for instance, in the black or brown community, oftentimes the majority of their employees are black and brown people. Yeah. And so do we have any data around what, you know, how many, what their employment looked like prior to COVID and then thereafter, um, and how many of those businesses um, that went out of business fell in specific categories? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. We don't have access to to uh, to data like that. Um, the uh, the economists at the city's economic development corporation do have a, have access to the what's called the micro data for the the quarterly census for employment and wages, uh, and and the numbers that I cited about the the gross job changes in the the lost jobs from businesses that closed their doors for good and the lost jobs and businesses still in business. That data comes from the Economic Development Corporation. But that even that data set doesn't provide information on the demographic characteristics of, of the workers. We do know that you know early in the pandemic, the, the main uh, government assistance program for businesses, the, the uh, PPP program, um, you know, short changed uh, a lot of minority owned businesses because that was a program that was put together rapidly. There was heavy reliance upon um, banks to uh, to uh, receive applications from affected businesses and process, process that. So a lot of small minority owned businesses that didn't have regular banking relationships were left out of that and and consequently benefited less from uh, that uh, that assistance and and that likely you know resulted in a, a greater failure rate among those businesses which as you as you noted you, you know a lot of um, locally owned uh, minority owned businesses do tend to hire uh, workers of color in disproportionate numbers so it's very likely that 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 blacks were overrepresented in in, in the category of people who lost jobs because businesses failed. James, this is Colleen Galvin. Thanks so much for bringing this important data to light and this issue. And sorry, you're under the weather. Um, you've already said that we don't have enough granularity for a real cross tab of um, race by occupation. But I think you said something early in the presentation that Black employment in New York City is concentrated heavily in two sectors, right? City yeah, employment yeah. and healthcare. And I'm I'm scratching my head because I can't imagine that either of those industries has had significant job cuts unless I've been well, living so, under a rock. So so in the government sector, of course, uh, uh, Chris Chris alluded to this in his report that the city workforce it, has declined significantly. Um, and the city is 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 now sort of aggressively pursuing, you know, efforts to staff back up. Um, and in in one of the in the uh, table that I had early on in my presentation, which which showed the payroll employment numbers for the latest month, um, there was actually a five thousand decline in government employment in New York City in April and. Um, you know, so that's all government. But I know from looking at those data every month that most of the, the, the uh, New York City government is by far the largest factor in the total government employment number in New York City. So so that change probably reflects the city. So the city has uh, you know lost a lot of employment and the state, the state government uh, has a similar 
uh, experience as as New York City. So there has been some um, uh, some employment loss there. The the third sector that has the highest number of blacks employed is retail. And you know I did mention that that within the face to face a group of industries, manufacturing and retailing, had the largest net declines relative to the pre-pandemic level. So retail employment is down about 40,000 from where it was before. So that that likely uh, affected a, a lot of Blacks. And then if you, if you couple, you know, those trends by uh, industry and education and, and so on with with a pretty well established notion that there's been uh, that there's a last hired first fired uh, uh, phenomenon that's usually at, at work when businesses downside and couple that also with um, you know an understanding that 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 racial discrimination has been a factor in hiring decisions uh, for a long time. That's not unique to New York City, certainly. That's 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 true in a lot of places. So um, black unemployment fell uh, considerably in the few years before the pandemic. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of that progress uh, was undone uh, because of the of the pandemic um, and, and blacks for, you know, many types of jobs have been at the end of the employment queue. So in a very strong economy, when overall unemployment is very low, uh, Blacks get drawn into the labor force. And and when there's disruption, then then Blacks uh, are, are dislocated uh, in disproportionate numbers. So that's what's happened uh, at this point. And while there had been some recovery in 21 and uh, uh, early 22, uh, that recovery has, you know, hasn't been benefiting blacks in the past year or so. Thank you for, 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 for whatever those reasons. Points. Thank you. One other question slash comment. Uh, you mentioned resident workers and, you know, piggybacking on what Laura was talking about regarding left behind workers. There, you know, New York City is, if not the most expensive, one of the most expensive places to live and operate a business. And the pandemic has led to a huge increase in remote workers. And that's led to an exodus from New York because people say, hey, if I can earn the same amount, keep my job in New York, quote, in New York, my New York company job and live at a place that has a 30 or 40 percent lower cost of living. I think that has been a significant phenomenon here in New York. And what you were saying in terms of some of the jobs where you're supporting, um, you know, whether it's retail or other areas where you have to be physically present with the population exodus that we've had in New York, I think that's probably been a factor. Yeah, no, I I, I I completely agree with with your comments on that. Um, uh, and 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 I guess I would add to that that um, low income people, uh, you know, tend to have fewer options. <laughs> uh, it's not as easy for them to move. So even though um, you know they understand the cost of living is much higher in New York City because of the lack of savings that prevents them from moving, relocating, going for some period of time without employment altogether in, in uh, the process of, of, of moving, um, they're less, they have less mobility opportunities geographically as well as economically. So um, that's clearly been a factor and, and, and that helps account for why the resident, where there's this disparity between you know, a greater drop in resident employment than payroll employment. So some people who used to live in New York City, worked in New York City, may still have that job, but because they're not living in New York City, you know, they've added to the decline in the resident uh, employment number. Um, 
but make the payroll num payroll employment numbers look better. No, I was gonna say, I know you wanted to speak. <laughs> Abby wanted to um, talk about the city's response. Yeah. Yeah, so um, one, I just want to thank James Parrott for the presentation today, but also the ongoing um, work that he and his team do to really highlight the key issues and, and particularly the disparities that we face in New York when it comes to employment. Um, it's an incredible resource for us to have to think about um, what we can do um, as a city to, to respond and address these issues. Um, and this issue has certainly not gone unnoticed by the city, and we are very much looking at it and trying to not only understand some of the key drivers, but probably more importantly, figure out what can we do differently to drive, to change this trend. Um, so I just want to say, um, so folks know, we have an active working group of um, some of the best research minds in the city working on this from um, the center, um, the mayor's office for economic opportunity, which has looked a long time at sort of the um, issues and drivers around poverty and have been looking at this with us. Um, the Economic Development Corporation has been on the front lines really helping us think about this, as has the, um, the Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence, uh, Marianne Schweitzman's group, which some of you know, um, who's always coming at this from a really interesting angle. So we pulled that group together um, along with the Mayor's Office for Equity um, to really try to understand the drivers, but then also look at some of the existing programs that we have that have been particularly targeted to um, to black New Yorkers um, and, and try to think about what do we need to do more of. So more to come on that, that will come out over the next um, few months um, as, we, as we learn more um, and looking forward to share that with everybody. Thank you. No additional questions. James, thank you so much for the presentation. And I think, you know, as a workforce development board, it'll be very interesting to see what comes of, um, you know, the work that the group is doing and seeing what our support and response can be. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>